Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. Hey, it's me, Alex, and we're continuing with our summer series of pretty incredible guests today. And I don't want to like make my guests nervous by already, you know, dropping the incredible word on him. But I got to tell you, when I think about food writers and when I think about people who are experts uh, at you know, taking the sensory delight that is eating and transposing it into the world of of words and doing it successfully. I I can only think of a handful of people that I who I really enjoy reading when they do that. And one of them's Tony Bourdain. One of them's Jim Harrison. Uh, we've lost them both, and uh, but we've got one with us now who I really enjoy. He's and he's also a friend of mine. It's Pete Doolin of Kansas City. Welcome, Pete Doolin, to Mysterious Goings On. Thanks so much. Hey, uh, yeah, you're in good company. Then, and, and even better is that you're still living. So, uh, yes, exactly. So. <laughs> let's let's keep it that way, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> Absolutely. At least for this interview. Yeah. You did. <laughs> Although you know, <laughs> you know, I'm looking for some ratings that could help. No, no, no. Let's don't do that. Um, he killed it. <laughs> literally <laughs> Pete uh, we we go way back I met you I think it was 2006 I was uh, with the PBS station here in town in Kansas City and you were um, running your own uh, which I think uh, ahead of its time online uh, magazine for want of a better term and uh, we we were you know just kind of feeling out potential opportunities unfortunately nothing worked out right away I don't think I think we did some things together but uh um, but I think it was the the great the greatest thing I take away from that is that I met you and I was very impressed by what you were doing and all your varied interests. So just as a way of filling people in, though, who haven't known you since then, you you are uh, a writer, an author of several uh, books. You, you speak. You you're and you're a chef. How would you describe yourself, though? Well, I guess uh, as far as the things that I do, that, that kind of sums it up. Um, as a, it's really boil it down, kind of comes down to the writing side and, and the culinary side. And I'm a creative person by nature, and I've been fortunate to be able to pursue a, a couple of different paths and have them overlap. So it's I've worked in um, the corporate world for quite a while coming out of college um, and after 10 years or so in the mutual fund industry, I realized that I was creatively burned out and that there was not much further uh, for me to go um, in terms of having fulfilling work. So I kind of took a step back and looked at what were things I was passionate about, where I really wanted to spend my time. And it really came down to um, writing, cooking, or traveling, or some combination of them. And so uh, I explored cooking initially, um, did a lot of research and thought I might want to go to culinary school and become a chef. And so before I spent the, the money on school, I decided to get some practical experience and um, worked in some restaurants at a hotel and then eventually landed at Lucy Frog in the River Market area of Kansas City. And did that for several years, um, did catering on the side, and realized that while I really enjoyed learning a sensory aspect and, and the craft of it, I was in my early 30s at the time and felt like I had gotten into the industry about 10 years too late. So I, I switched gears. Would you say that it was, and, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you say you got in about 10 years too late. Is it because it's so physically grueling? Is that part of it or, or what? Yeah, I think so. It's, um, I mean, you can certainly jump into the industry at, at different ages, different points in your life. And if you're really driven and determined and um, skilled, you can, I think you can be successful. But um, looking at the people that I was working with and other people in the industry, um, I realized that in order for me to get to where I wanted to, to be, if I was going to become a, a chef, I wanted to be the best I possibly could. Um, I didn't want to just become a, a career line cook or, you know, in order to really kind of make all the, the time and effort worthwhile. Cause you'll, you'll work 60, 70 hours a week. Um, 
if you're at a place where it's, it's really busy and thriving. And so there's a, a big trade-off there. And it does take its toll physically, mentally, and lifestyle-wise because you're, you're working when other people are off on the weekends or in the evenings. And I just decided that, one, the lifestyle wasn't quite for me, and two, being in my early 30s, by the time I got really good at becoming a chef and learning, it would be seven, eight years down the, the road. So I'd be closer to 40 when your body does start to slow down and, and break down from all the physical, grueling work. So I just I stepped back a little bit um, to reevaluate and look at other options. And that kind of led me to um, the next major shift, which was pursuing writing. Mm-hmm. And so I applied to a graduate school at, and got into Emerson College based oh. in Boston. Yes. And uh, they have a, an excellent writing program there. Uh, and I was specifically, I was drawn to their um, nonfiction, their creative nonfiction writing program. A lot of schools that I researched um, across the country, they would have an emphasis in fiction or poetry or other literary arts, which I didn't think would provide a very viable career path. <laughs> um, so, and I didn't want to go into straight journalism because um, that really didn't suit my writing um, skills or, or interests. Uh, so I found this program at Emerson um, where this track of writing nonfiction, but in a creative way that borrowed from elements of um, fiction techniques uh, was incorporated into the writing. <laughs> and, and that's just a fancy way of saying that you could do storytelling about um, nonfiction subject matter. Yeah. And, and that really appealed to me. Well, and that's evident. Um, I've, just indulge me, and I won't. I probably won't read it as well as you wrote it, but let me just read something. This is from Pete's blog. He's probably sitting here going, I did not know you are going to read from my blog, but I'm going to. <clears throat> just listen to this sentence. You cannot touch smoke. Smoke touches you. The scent of smoke from wild plum, oak, grapevine, and lavender clings to my skin, my hair, and my clothes. Smoke hangs on with persistence, a ghost that lingers, a presence that is intangible, but most certainly there. I mean, that's the lead-in to a blog post about about a fire that you built, and there's way more to that than that at the at a winery you, you, at the winery you work at. And I just I just have to tell you, I just, it just you, it's so funny how you just I had that teed up because I love that sentence, and uh, here you are talking about it. So now I fully understand that because I don't think I was aware you went to Emerson, and uh, it's clear that you you definitely learned your craft very well. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, that's, that passage, I think, it exemplifies like the type of writing that I would like to do um, all the time, or at least aspire to, um, where you're able to write about something that's real, that's happening, um, and describe it in a way that um, excites the senses, um, draws people in, right. not necessarily in a sensational way but in a way that it's with the word choices and the, the phrasing and just the perspective that it's something that people may not have looked at it or thought about it in quite that way. And so they're, they're just drawn in out of curiosity. Um, as, as humans, like we are, are drawn to stories right. all the way back from, you know, the, the days of being in caves or campfires to um, today where we're staring at um, digital screens, our own little handheld campfires, if you will, Hmm. and getting stories through words and images and videos that way. Uh, Writing-wise, I I think it's still a powerful way to describe the world and experiences, Um, but it's also challenging because um, oftentimes as a writer, it's about producing quickly, um, succinctly, efficiently. Right. Uh, and you don't always have the, the time or the opportunity to um, be more um, creative and 
shape the set the scene and and describe things in a more creative way. Right. I, I started my career, I cut my teeth. I mean, I have a degree in, in writing, not from Emerson, but I have a degree in writing and I cut my teeth though as a journalist where you're, this kind of writing would be more called a feature style rather than a straight news style. But I seem to excel more at that, actually. It seemed like more, uh, I guess if bylines are a judge, most of my bylines I got were for kind of things uh, in that vein. The more, I guess, the, as you say, the more kind of the creative nonfiction style. I think that's why I, I'm drawn to what you write, Pete, is because I'm a big fan of, uh, as I said, of Jim Harrison. And his last book, A Really Big Lunch, is like one of my favorite books of all time. It's one of those books where you're constantly <laughs> underlining stuff and or or. Or if you're like me, I'm a little finicky about my books that I keep, and sometimes I don't fully un underline. I might put a post-it note in there, and then I realize, well, that looks ridiculous because you've got a book with this big fan of post-it notes, you know, sticking out of it. But, uh, but I get that when I read your stuff, and you write for a number of publications. Uh, there's a there's a publication there. You're seeing quite a very nice glossy publication called Feast that's pretty big here in Missouri, um, and you but you've written for some other other publications. Is there a and I don't want to put you on the spot too much here, but is there a particular piece you've ever written that is just like, oh my gosh, this is my, this is my uh, Citizen Kane here. This is my, this is my thing. Or are you still chasing it? Mm. Um, I think it's still chasing it in a way. It's part of it is um, that there's always room for improvement. There's always um, a different way to tell a story, and you know, part of it's what you want to bring to the assignment if you're writing freelance, um, like I do for many publications, and also what the publication's voice and its intent and the audience it's trying to reach and what the editor wants. So a lot of the, uh, the freelance work that I do is more, a bit more news-driven right. or reporting food journalism, if you will. Mm -hmm. So um, there was, and this is quite a while back, but... Um, Years ago, I wrote a story for the Kansas City Star about tea, um, Lucy's tea, and I, I focused on a couple of different um, people in Kansas City that were connected to tea. Um, that was a, a fun story to to write because um, one of them was um, Zhang Tea, a uh, Zhang Tea, I'm based in Crown Center in Kansas City, mm -hmm. um, and he has this um, tea farm that's um, in the mountains in a remote part of China. And it was a way to tell this, to introduce the idea of uh, this tea that he actually grows, um, harvests, process, and then ships halfway around the world to sell in the shop in Kansas City. It was a, a wonderful opportunity to build a story around this individual a character, if you will, set the scene with the lush landscape um, and the conditions where the tea bushes are grown and then describe the process of how we harvest and processes that tea and, and brings it um, here. Right. And then those sorts of, of stories um, are always ones that I, I love to tell and would like to, to chase more. But again, it, it kind of depends on the publication I'm writing for and, the opportunity doesn't always present itself. So it's having my my blog is kind of a good outlet, I guess, to do more storytelling driven um, writing that doesn't right. necessarily fit in the box of publications. Yeah, and you, you also on your social media, your I what I <laughs> I love your I love what when you just talk about a meal you had. And, and I'm not going to give away who this is about, but just, can I just do one, you start off this piece you did recently <laughs> and it's you said self, self-critical food review. And I'm not going to say the location yeah. or anything, but it's like, clearly the cut broccoli was frozen and chopped unevenly further. It had freezer burn. So some pieces were Frankenstein gray green instead of bright green inedible. The burgers were cooked to temperature and resembled a homemade patty, providing a quick nostalgia trip back to childhood bliss. However, the honey wheat bread was a poor substitute for actual burger buns. Disappointing. Melted cheese strewn across the pickles, onions, and mushrooms resembled a line cook's fanciful interpretation of a Jackson Pollock painting. Or maybe the kitchen didn't have a block of sharp white cheddar to slice and melt for better presentation. Sad. 
<laughs> and I'm, I'm laughing because I enjoy the writing, and I, I'm picturing it. There's not even a photo, I don't think, in this post of what you're eating. It's just your descriptions are so rich, and 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 you know what? And, and just so people understand. Pete is not like unfair or me. I, you seem to me, you always seem to be bending over backwards to find something good about just about every meal you eat. Is that fair? Um, yeah, generally. Yeah. It's, I mean, if I'm going to write about it, I, I'd rather emphasize the positive rather than highlight the, the negative just for the, the sake of being negative. You know, it's, I think there's a, there's a room and need to have informed criticism, particularly about food, and I emphasize informed, because everybody has an opinion. <laughs> right, right. Not necessarily everybody is informed or knowledgeable about what they're talking about. But like with, it, with that piece of writing that you just um, read, it's uh, one, it was just kind of a one-off thing, right. and part of it was the idea popped into my head, and if it's not clear to your listeners, I was actually describing a meal that I had prepared. Um, <laughs> so I, I was actually being the food critic of my own food. Exactly, but I didn't want to um, say it. I wanted to see if you'd say it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of um, poking fun at um, myself as the cook or, or chef, and I say that with air quotes, but also... Um, food writers um, and, and Yelpers, um, you know, in, in particular, people that offer opinions on social media about food and um, how it can be a bit pretentious and overly analytical at times. Right. So that was written um, certainly tongue in cheek, definitely, uh, but honest. Well, it was, and, and there's more. There's so much. I'd love to read the whole thing, but the but the the ending is so great that it brings it home here. Likely won't order this same meal again. Hard not to eat here since it is so close to home. Heard there's chocolate chip ice cream. Might raid the freezer later. Definitely won't leave a tip. It's <laughs> Pete. It's just. It's a joy. It's uh, you, you know. There's. I am always looking for excuses not to open Facebook. Yeah, and I mean seriously, I'm, I am. I if I weren't involved in this big communications industry I'm involved in, I, I wonder that I'd still be there. But you're one of those bright, uh, shining moments there that really uh, that makes it work for me. So thank you for that. But um, uh, there was another one you did recently too, and I, I don't mean to just keep dinging, you know, pulling stuff out here, but it just it really spoke to me. It's like, but the way you talk about food, though, there was some group or local group, a foodie club of some sort, right that. Uh, we're making some comments about food and you just laid into them and uh, you're like utterly pretentious and self-absorbed. Some of the best food I've eaten in the world didn't look pretty in presentation and certainly wasn't prepared for the sake of someone's Instagram feed. Yet another example of why I dislike self-important quote foodies unquote and quote influencers unquote. I think that's how you say pfft. anyway. I want it was a raspberry. Right. I want to break bread with people, not self-important shallow ding dongs that preach about quote respect unquote. And I, I mean, do you get this is this is another reason why I think that this that that your food writing is so good. You get passionate about this and uh, and I've known from kind of working around you or knowing you for a few years, you know, not we're not like, you know, bosom pals, but we I've been around you enough to know you don't suffer fools. And it comes out. True. And, and it's um I think there's so just looking at the the two pieces that you cited from Facebook posts, I mean, very different in a way. Like uh, the first one where I'm just uh, critiquing my own cooking in right. this meal was both. It was just a kind of a fun idea. Right. And, and sometimes like it pops into my head and it's a fun thing to do, but also it's kind of a, a writing exercise, if you will, hmm. to flex the creative muscles and to do something that's a little off theater different. Um, and there's you know no real consequences to it, but it's a way to get out of the routine and and write in a different way. And so sometimes I'll do that, whether it's social media or my blog, um, just to keep the writing skills honed or right. to do things in a different way. The other piece that you read, it was a little bit more critical of influencers in particular uh, about. Um, foodies that are quote unquote influencers was definitely more um, personal and 
disappointed in um I think just the the passion of my opinion definitely came through without trying to be too hateful about it. Right, right. Um but um I, I have pretty strong opinions about the the value of some influencers. I, I don't want to be too right um, generic and broad based. There there's certainly value with uh the role of um influencers, whether it's food or um other arenas. But a lot of them have kind of taken their their platform, if you will, and taken advantage of it um or tried to profit from it in a way that's detrimental to um the business that they're writing about that they are supposedly trying to promote and support. Right. And um and it's I mean it's a somewhat recent phenomenon. Uh, I guess in, in social media and you know the rise of influencers, you know that it's just an extension of both foodie culture as well as social media culture revolving around food. Well, it used, um, it like used... Yelp. Oh yeah, Yelp. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, and just to kind of draw a further distinction um, with the whole phenomenon of social media and you know giving rise to platforms like Yelp where people can offer their own reviews yeah. or commentary, if you will. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing um, in and of itself. Um, you know, uh, you know, access to the internet and platforms like that has democratized the reviewing process, whether it's about movies or food or what have you. So if as a consumer, like if you're like, looking at, oh, where should I go and dine out to eat? You're on vacation or you're traveling for business and you're in an unfamiliar place. Then you can turn to a resource like Yelp and you're crowdsourcing, essentially. True. Now, the, you know, there's a lot of noise in the, in the signal, and so depending on what your tastes are and who you're um, reading uh, as far as Yelp reviews, it can be of some value or no value at all. Um, but you're the person that's consuming that those reviews, um, and there's the person, the many people that are generating the reviews, um, and then you have influencers, which, in my opinion, the vast majority of them, they're serving themselves first. Um, their influence is really built around the following day build their aesthetic, their identity. And then what they believe they're offering, one, to their social media audience, and two, they're trying to leverage that influence or their reputation to the businesses that they're covering. Ah. And more and more of them are doing so in a way where they're expecting freebies, they're expecting consideration, um, and um, things that actually cost the restaurant or bar by comping them free food and drink. And sometimes not just for themselves, but like, oh, I'm going to bring six of my besties and we're all going to post photos oh, and, man. you know, yeah. text. And so that that kind of evolution of writing a review that's, you know, crowdsourced and it's out there and people can take it for what it's worth versus shifting the, the access, if you will, where the influencer is the center point and everything they write and produce um, revolves around them and people gravitate towards that. Now that has some, you know, you can say, well, what's the difference between that versus a food editor or food critic for a major newspaper. Right. At a very basic level, there's some, parallels as far as what the person's trying to do but usually uh, and there are some key distinctions there like if you're a food critic writing for um, a website a newspaper or some other professional organization there's right. usually a code of ethics there right um, and um, you're getting paid you're getting edited other people are looking at your work so there's kind of some structure and, and things in place before it actually goes 
live and, and gets published. Whereas influencers don't necessarily have those criteria in place as far as ethics and being edited. And, and a lot of times, like, they're, they're just simply amateurs, people that profess a love for food, but they don't have much, if any, training right. with um, writing or journalism. And so the way they, they think and promote and what they ask for sometimes exceeds the normal boundaries of how a, a food reporter or food critic would operate. Yeah, and they, of course, I'm a trained journalist, used to be one, and uh, so I think that's one reason uh, why I think when podcasting started, it was a little easier for me to get certain guests, not for uh, this, because I've been podcasting since about the time I met you, and uh, for, for a while there, I was getting some national guests for a different show I used to do about politics, and the, the one comment I got a lot was, "Oh man, you you, you actually talk to me like a journalist would," <laughs> and and so <laughs> right. So, but you know, nowadays though, I mean, technically, you can technically podcast out of your pocket with your phone. You can definitely, you know, I I describe this to a lot of my clients. I'm like, you know, you have the entire news media in your pocket, and you know, if you have a, have a smartphone, I mean. You know, you've got a TV station, it's called YouTube. You've got a radio station for all intents and purposes, which could be a podcast or Twitter even. You know, Twitter kind of short bursts mm -hmm. like radio. You've got, you got a newspaper, and that's like uh, Facebook. You know, so th there's this whole thing. So everybody's empowered, which is a good thing to a degree, but not everybody um, is informed. I kind of, the way you said earlier, you know, I, I like informed opinions. I kind of feel that way about voting. I, I don't really, I'm not the one that says everybody go out and vote. I'm really not. I'm the guy who says, <laughs> if, if you've bothered to look under the issues and knew, know anything about the candidates, please go vote. If you, if you haven't, please stay home. That's that's what I tell people all the time. But yeah. so yeah. so thinking about this too, the other thing that, that could be damaging is when you have kind of an amateur person and doing what you're saying, like I'm going to bring all my pals and we're going to do this. Restaurants in general are operating on razor thin margins, and just can't afford to treat everybody and their dog. I mean, right? Right. And um, absolutely. And so, and the restaurants, far to a lesser extent, but uh, restaurants and you know the chefs, the owners. They get asked for freebies and, and handouts and things that cost them money every single day. Yeah. Not just from um, influencers or um, you know people that have a unsatisfactory experience and they want to be comped for this or that, but also from um, you know nonprofits or people in the community. They're trying to do fundraisers or yep. other um, events, and you know there's a certain purpose for that and it's you know it's noble and 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 there's a honorable goal i guess but there's so many nonprofits, there's so many causes if you will where everybody's trying to fundraise and these chefs and owners uh, of restaurants they get bombarded to the point where it's just not sustainable oh, yeah. and you're you'd be literally giving away uh the store week in week out and how are you supposed to make payroll and, and operate your business if you're giving away so much? So there's, you know, it's striking a, a balance. It's definitely a give and take. I mean, every, there, there's no restaurant, I, especially starting out, who doesn't want some good word of mouth going out there. I guess it's just part of the, it's part of the business. And, and you, you talk about your love of food and, and wanting to be a chef and wanting to do these things and, and, and you have to a different degree and a different path than you initially thought. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, uh, in addition to your your food writing that you do for publications and that thing, but you, you've also written, I believe, is it about four books about food, beer, wine, and spirits? And I mean, you know, you'll you'll tell me, don't say this, but I think you're the dean of 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 those topics in Kansas City as far as is laying out who and what and where you can go to get the best craft beer or or spirits or, or wines in the area. Um, so when did this happen? When did uh, when did you? I mean, because I know food and drink are obviously together, but not every chef I know of, not every cook I know of, not every foodie or food enthusiast I know knows anything about spirits and beer and wine. Well, first of all, thanks for your, your kind remarks. Um, so I, I've been a freelance writer um, for about 20 years, part-time, full-time, and 
the bulk of that's been focused on food writing, but then business writing and, and about other topics. And I would say about five years ago, five, six years ago, I started um, pitching ideas or stories um, about craft beer because that was trending um, in Kansas City. There were more breweries that were opening up. And, you know, craft beer is just kind of a, a new contemporary name for micro brewed beer. Right. Um, and there's some, you know, differences. And you know, micro brewed beer has been around in Kansas City for quite a while, as well as elsewhere around the country. Um, Boulevard is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Wow. Uh, which kind of brings me back to part of my inspiration for um, my second book, um, which was Keithy L. Trail. Yeah. was the 25th anniversary of Boulevard Brewing as well as Free State Brewing in Lawrence. Um, in 2014, they were both going to celebrate their 25th anniversary. And I had um, the tail end of 2013, had visited some breweries in uh, northwest Arkansas and was thinking a lot about craft beer and um, this idea of writing about... Um, breweries in Kansas City and like what has um, opened up and is operating over the past 25 years leading up to um, the anniversary of Boulevard and Free State became the the kernel for this, this book, Casey Ale Trail. Oh, okay. And so, and I wanted to produce that book in 2014, the year that the anniversary is being celebrated. So I ended up um, self-publishing the book. Huh. Um, and I've I've had different career um, experiences where I, I know enough about writing, editing. I've done some print production. I had a, a good friend that's a really strong um, designer and uh, art director, Eric Shotland. He and I kind of uh, collaborated. Um, I did my due diligence on the business side, and I worked with the a print um, broker to figure out the best way to print the book in a way that would be um, reasonable cost. Then I worked with um, Eric, the art director, to create the look and feel for the book, and then went out and did the work of researching, um, writing, editing, photographing, um, and pulling that book together in just a, a few months. Um, and was able to get the book published by, I think, October or November of 2014. And it was just, um, it, it was a great experience both to challenge myself and to push myself writing-wise, but also use these other skills that I had um, to produce something that was physical versus just a newspaper article or an online article. I had, I had something physical to show for my efforts and something I could sell. Right. Um, and this is, you know, still relatively early in as far as self-publishing and how that, that avenue was catching on um, among writers. Right. Um, so that, I think, well, I, the previous book that I did was um, a cookbook that I published as a... Um, a compilation of recipes that had been published in the Kansas City Star yeah. magazine. Last Bite. Featuring work by other stuff. Yeah, wow. Last Bite. Yeah, with the wonderful and photography from Roy Inman in there. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. And uh, I'm so really proud of that that book. And I mean, that featured recipes from the top chefs and cooks um, around Kansas City at the time. Um, it was published by the Kansas City Star's book department when there was one. Ugh. And I learned a lot about... Um, publishing, um, and promoting books through that experience. Um, and I collaborated both with Roy Inman on photography as well as Eric Shotland, again, on the design of the book and had a lot of free reign to kind of pull that book together. And we literally put that, produced that book in about three months. It was a crazy fast timetable. You know, I, I remember, but, I'm sorry, to interrupt, I, I interviewed you and Roy uh, about this for my book my company blog when this came out and I don't even think, I don't think I realized you put it together in that short a time. Maybe you, maybe you did tell me at the time, but it didn't stick. You put this, this incredible book together in about three months. 
Yeah, it's I, part of it was we. So the the book featured 100 recipes. Again, it was published in, in the Star. So um, most of the photographs were already had been published in the newspaper, True. Um, as well as the recipes. So part of it was just deciding on what material was going to be there, creating material for the, the front of the book as far as an in introduction um, and a forward, figuring out the organization and um, and coordinating between the art director and the photographer to pull it all together. Right. Um, in which e- even having the material off the shelf, so to speak, three months was an incredibly fast timeline to pull together. Like, you know, um, a traditional book publisher wouldn't be able to do that kind of project in that amount of speed unless they were to drop all their other projects. Yeah. And it's Um, such an elegant book. It's so elegant. And it's so, and I, of course, used to get, when I get the star and open up, they're there to the recipes be, but it's so great to have them in one spot. I have this book. I've, I've attempted a few recipes. It's, it's a delight. It really is. Thank you. One of the, the great takeaways from both the, the cookbook last bite, as well as Casey ale trail, but it's published was not only the writing aspect, but then kind of acting as the, the editor and project manager for both of the books to pull them together. Right. And then, switching hats to be the promoter and the <laughs> social media manager for it and then getting out and creating events right. um, and learning all the things that are almost kind of a, a given if you're an, a self-published author or even if you're published traditionally oh, yeah. um, today, you're kind of expected to wear all those hats to promote your book, to do events. And so I realized that I needed to learn those things and, um, I didn't expect to make any money off of those first two books. I just treated it as a learning curve. Hmm. Um, fortunately, both books did some some modest sales and was able to generate some income off of them. Do you uh, do you bring those in tow with you when you do speaking engagements to this day, or do you just kind of tell people you can find me on Amazon, or how do you do that now? Um, yeah, no, everything that I've learned. Um, Writing wise and publishing wise is kind of built on itself um, and carries forward. Um, so, the next two books that I, I published, I did this, the, the same thing and wore the same hats. And, you know, I understood all right, I need to do this for social media. I need to um, set up events and do um, things that would grab the attention of my audience and meet people where they were. Right. So, uh, the third book that I did was Kansas City Beer, I hit you bring in Kansas City. And then my most recent book is Expedition of Thirst, which explores breweries, wineries, and distilleries in central Kansas and Missouri. Um, and each of those, of those books, the, the nice thing is that it's, they're very topical and they're very focused. So, right. um, you know, people enjoy food and drink. And so you're already meeting people halfway there. Um, if they're interested in, in that topic. And then it's just explaining to them the, the purpose of the book and the appeal of it. And it, it still it takes some work. Like, um, having you know great material and a, a great cover to the book is important. Yes. But it's still there's a lot of hand selling and promoting the book online and creating events um, and doing talks at libraries or before groups to share the message of the book and and background that's going to generate interest and word of mouth. Um, and all the hats you you still wear, speaking of hats, now you're also, I guess, your day job in a lot of ways. You're a chef and uh, event manager at a local winery, correct? Yes, yes. Um, so about a year ago, I kind of switched gears um, from full-time freelance writing because um, one of the wineries that I discovered – um, when I was researching Expedition of Thirst was Fun Style Vineyards and Winery based in Excelsior Springs. And as I got to know the owner um, and she got to know me, she re- realized that I had this um, culinary background but also communications background and she had a need for both. And so I started doing work on the side for her and the winery while I was freelance writing. And then I, about a year ago, I um, switched 
where I was um, either thriving part-time and then I took a full-time position with the winery where I can um, work as the, the chef and produce food for uh, catered events at the winery as well as um, specials on the weekend um, and create uh, food that's out of caliber with the wine. Right. And then also represent the, the winery through um, the communications newsletter, social media, website, and um, events to represent the, the brand. Yeah, and there, there are some wonderfully tasty uh, posts you do, uh, both on your personal accounts and on the winery's account, uh, of, of the, the really game-changing things I think you're doing, um, matching, pairing, matching, pairing is the word, Alex, pairing these wonderful wines that Fence Style produces with some delightful uh, ingredients. And what I love is you you seem to be in love with, and as you should be, I, I, I believe, fresh ingredients and seasonal ingredients. And you seem to always have something, you're, you're whipping up something that, of course, you know, a Philistine like myself would never have thought of, but will definitely eat. So I just love what you're coming up with. And so I, I think as we wind down here, I wanted to ask you, though, would you say that that is a, uh, something that feeds your creative impulses a little bit to, to come up with those kind of pairings and those kinds of dishes? Absolutely. I, I think if you're creative and lately, um, having more than one channel or, or place to uh, demonstrate your creativity is, is important. Um, and one can feed the other. Um, and what I didn't realize 20 years ago when I was, um, at Emerson College, and you know, I realized, oh, I can go off on my um, cooking background to inform the writing I wanted to do, and that I could be a food writer and, and write from a different perspective than the average person, even back then. And this is, you know, the relatively early days of food writing, uh, modern food writing, I should say, before um, you know the term food porn was created, and then <laughs> you know even before foodies existed. Um, and I realized uh, professionally I could marry both interests and in that my love of food and how it stimulates the senses could carry over to the writing that I did then. Um, and that's those two things, um, food and writing, have kind of been uh, pathways that have crisscrossed throughout my career, even today, when I'm working at the winery and working with fresh ingredients that are seasonal and local and where I source them um, in forms of the cooking, but also how I you know, write and share about it. And it keeps my senses sharp as, as well as a writer if I'm writing about other um, topics or other businesses. I think it's really important and, and something that writers um, either don't develop or they overlook a lot of times is the use of your senses. Right. Um, and like we rely on our visual sense so much just day to day, whether you're a writer or not. But paying attention to how things smell, taste, the texture, the sound, yeah. are all things that you can incorporate into writing or just, you know, even if you're just doing a short little ditty about your day or an experience that you had at the lake, um, or if you're writing. Um, a Yelp review or something on social media about this fantastic experience, you can incorporate the senses and use that in a way to make it more immediate, more visceral, more interesting versus just laying on the flowery words and description right. or, oh my God, it's just amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, re I really want the word amazing to be retired from everybody's vocabulary because as I'm fond of saying, if everything's amazing, nothing's amazing. Right, exactly. <laughs> if everything uh, is awesome, yeah, I... nothing is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely, you know, my work at the, the winery informs my writing and the writing that I do also informs how I, I cook and present food and the things that I, I learn at the winery too, because I, I have a, a very small hand in helping with some of the winery work and bottling and harvesting grapes in the fall 
And um, all those different activities are learning experiences, and it, it provides more um, experience, if you will, that um, I can store up in my creative bank and draw on later, whether it's about the winery or about something else, because I've had these rich experiences in my life. It's and it's so evident. I, hey, I'm going to do something mean to you. I'm going to do. A, I want to ask for a quick lightning round. Just a couple of little quick answer things because we're we've gone long and I don't care because I just like this is one of those interviews that I've so enjoyed and I I look at the clock and I go, holy cats, we just started ten minutes ago. Oh no, we didn't. But uh, I I so enjoy <laughs> hearing your perspectives and and of course I love food. I'm an amateur cook myself and uh, I'm I'm constantly learning and. Um, always kind of uh, figuratively looking over your shoulder to try and get tips. But l- let me ask you something really quick. What is one thing, and I mean, again, this is kind of a short thing, so if you can, what is one thing you wish on behalf of uh, being somebody who makes food, but also somebody who, who as you so wonderfully discussed, uh, respects food in the sense of, of who makes it and how it's consumed and using all your senses, what's one tip or one thing you would wish people would, would know or think about next time they're at a restaurant? I would say ask questions. If you're genuinely, genuinely interested in in food and or drink, ask questions um, to to learn. Um, You know, it, it expresses interest. It creates an opportunity for exchange. And, you know, whether you're chatting with the the chef, the sommelier, the the server, or uh, the bartender, as long as you're not obnoxious, you're not asking a million questions when they're, they're super busy, more often than not, they're happy to share that information with you because they're, you know, these people are professionals. They're experts at what they do. They have so much information that oftentimes they don't have the opportunity to share. But if you take an interest and, and you ask, well, you know, where did this wine come from or what does it mean to be biodynamic or I'm not familiar with this ingredient or this cooking technique. Can you tell me about it? That creates an opportunity for um, dialogue and communication and that helps you grow to be more informed. It also builds that relationship with the person that you're interacting with and, um, a few weeks ago, I was just outside of Chicago with a friend, uh, visiting a friend, and we went and uh, we went to a restaurant. And um, we he loves Thai food and uh, um, Vietnamese food, and and uh, he frequently goes there for work. And and so we went uh, to this place not far from where we were um, and uh, sat down. And I ordered. I just started asking questions about the pad Thai. That I that's what I wanted. He was going to 